Hello everyone, and welcome to this diversity video presentation for Pink Therapy. The title of this module is Sexual Health and Stigma, the Discrimination and Stereotypes Relating Sexually Transmitted Infections to Gender, Sexuality, and Relationship Diverse Communities. I am Eduardo Perez, Brazilian medical doctor in the field of sexual health and HIV medicine, psychosexual therapies, and GSRD therapies. I chose to bring this topic as I witnessed the impact of the stigmatization of STIs on a daily basis and how it is broadly associated with LGBTQ plus people. I had come across very little material on it so far and thought it would be interesting to dig deeper into it. We will discuss STI and stigma definitions, take a look at what contributes to social st STI stigma, the intersections between LGBTQ plus discrimination and STI prejudice, a few of the ways in which they are expressed, and finally, some ideas on support provision. But before I move any further, a warning. Although we are approaching this theme from a professional perspective, it can also correlate to your personal life. For that reason, before discussing STIs, HIV, sexual behavior, and mental health, I would like to ask you to be mindful of your triggers and give yourself permission to take as many breaks as necessary. Also, Whenever there are any contacts that may be triggering, you will find this sign at the top right corner of the slide. And since this module explores STI stigma in a specific group of people, let's define what the terminology entails. Why STIs and not STD? Firstly, bear in mind that the correct terminology in use currently is sexually transmitted infections rather than sexually transmitted diseases, as STD was wrong by the sheer definition of the term disease, which is determined by the presentations of signs and symptoms. STIs can be completely asymptomatic and still be transmitted. It also led to a negative assumption that someone who is diagnosed with the STI is a sick person. With that said, let's talk about STIs. Sex as an activity is the perfect means for transmission of infection. It involves the skin-on-skin -skin contact, friction, and exchange of fluids, with or without penetration being factored in. From an objective perspective, STIs are part of the life of those who are sexually active. There are dozens of STIs. Some, such as syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, and HIV, are spread mainly by sexual contact, meaning that sex has been identified as the primary or most important form of contact. Other infections, including Zika and monkeypox, can be spread sexually, but are more often spread through several other ways than just sex. Very often, they are represented as something monstrous, frightening, painful, or uncomfortable. Yet, STIs are also universal. They do not discriminate people according to race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, religion, relationship status, age, and more. The moral reasoning behind sexual behaviors largely contributes to stigma around STIs, which is worse for those who already experience social stigma. On that note, let's also define stigma. Stigma can be interpreted as the disapproval of or prejudice against an individual, diagnosis, behavior, group and or community based on characteristics that make them be perceived differently. Thinking about S stigmas around STIs, the feelings of shame and judgmental ideas regarding sexual activities, sex work, sexual orientations and non-conventional sexual behaviors often intersect with the shame around STIs, intensifying and socially justifying stigma. Multiple variants contribute to stigma, stereotyping, shame, internalized discrimination, prejudice. So it is common to encounter different definitions and types of stigma. In the context of healthcare and diagnosis related stigma, mainly the study around mental health disorders and substance misuse, there are four main types of stigma. Structural, that relates to the norms and institutions that are the foundations of society. Public, that is manifested through social interactions, label avoidance as a response to the public stereotype and discrimination, and finally the self-stigma, or the learned understanding that a diagnosis is negative and to be associated with it is equally bad. 
The socio-ecological framework of stigma paints a more comprehensive picture of how these different types of stigma are connected as they emerge from and influence each other across different systems and social settings among which healthcare can be included. There are sets of social norms and rules inherently rooted in moral codes. The stigma and its ways of manifesting are one of the ways in which these norms are enacted and learned by, by individuals within the systems. And one of the means which stigma manifests is through media and mass campaigns. It is undeniable that media and awareness campaigns have contributed to build a stigmatizing perspective around STIs. Moral beliefs of adequate social behavior determining what types of people should be seen as carriers of diseases, therefore being avoided, has always set the tone of these campaigns. Women, especially sexually liberated ones, sex workers, mainly cisgender females and transgender women, as well as queer individuals, usually are seen as morally deviant um, and have always portrayed these campaigns. The messaging behind STI awareness ads has always revolved around fear mongering, promoting stigma and shame, resulting in a generalized avoidance about the subject. The next slide contains a video campaign with such example. As a hot young 21 year old girl, your chances of getting it on with a guy with a sexually transmitted disease is one in 10. This looks a likely one. There's always someone worse off than you. One in 50 of these lovers could have AIDS. Could be him. Or him. Well, it's one of them anyway. Other tropes that are generally featured through the fear approach are the reference to monogamous norms and how STIs can serve as evidence of betrayals of trust and cheating behaviors, or an odd to the traditional family institution in which STIs are blemished from a lustful and immoral past and visually associated with kinky or non-conventional sexual practices, or even a clear discrimination toward, toward countries, regions, and social communities that are deemed less developed associating STIs and HIV with the notion of lack of civilization. And the most commonly portrayed, the othering of queer individuals, especially men who have sex with men, they're still framed as high-risk groups or uncertain medical assessments and deserving of punishment by the universe with STIs and HIV due to their divine behaviors by morally conservative views. This has been well evidenced in the UK, for example, through policies established by the Conservative Party, such as Section 28, that place barriers to access to information and specific care for vulnerable LGBTQ plus communities. The prejudice and the damage caused by this policy, as well as the historical discrimination of gender and sexually diverse individuals, still impacts advances for our community to this day. The next slide, shows a video about HIV pre prevention from the early years of the world pandemic. Pay attention on how the narrative of we versus them is played out. At first, only gays and IV drug users were being killed by AIDS. But now we know every one of us could be devastated by it. The fact is, over 50,000 men, women and children now carry the AIDS virus. That in three years, nearly 2,000 of us will be dead. That if not stopped, it could kill more Australians than World War II. But AIDS can be stopped, and you can help stop it. If you have sex, have just one safe partner, or always use condoms. Always. And this narrow-minded and discriminating approach to STI awareness is certainly not a thing from the past. 
some very recent national sex awareness campaigns from Brazil, dating back to early years of the single mandate of Bolsonaro's government, depicted people looking appalled by the idea of STIs and suddenly blaming the person who has been diagnosed for their own diagnosis, framing having STIs as a lack of self-care. It is worth remembering that this comes from the same government that reduced national funding for STI and HIV healthcare, as well as to sex education and sex awareness. There is a covert negative meaning behind messages such as, if you do not take care of yourself, AIDS will catch you. And without condoms, you take the risk of catching an STI. This blaming and shaming approach is clear on the next video from a clinic in the USA. Be warned that there will be loud noises. Have an STD or anything, do you? Um, no. No? I don't think so. Uh, okay, so you've never been tested? No. Uh, really? Okay. I mean, it's not that hard. I know. Yeah. Anyway, it's something to consider. Okay. It's a dangerous world out there. <laughs> Getting tested for sexually transmitted diseases doesn't have to be scary. Learn more at GetCheckedOmaha.com. Alongside these already established negative bias surrounding STIs, the impact of HIV to the LGBTQ plus community and the historic association of HIV AIDS with gay, bisexual, and transgender individuals, as well as with marginalized communities such as sex workers, racial and ethnicity minorities heavily contributed to our unwanted stereotype as sexually moral beings, culprits of sexual transmitted infections. The structural discrimination aside, conservative propaganda has largely been responsible for promoting negative campaigns targeting these communities, opposing policies and development around sex education and social awareness towards sexual health, sexual diversity, gender diversity, and safer sex practices. This impacted the research around the management of HIV in the early years of the epidemic, a scenario that only changed to the, due to community-led response, mainly by LGBTQ plus civil rights movements. And although much has changed since, we still are impacted by social stigma and STI-related stigma. The sexualization of queer bodies and the covert belief that LGBT people are more promiscuous leads to a stereotyping risk framework classifying queer people, namely men have sex with men and transgender women, as riskier groups, a terminology that has been replaced by risk behavior to reduce stigmatization. These moral approaches are still supported by structural institutions such as healthcare systems, as seen during the monkeypox outbreak and the bleak response from governments and even the WHO given it affected MSM, sex workers, and other marginalized communities. Although the presentation and impact of HIV and monkeypox are completely different from a clinical perspective, the similarities between the stigma that they have placed upon gays, bisexuals, transgenders, as well as upon sex workers is uncanny. And the discrimination between STIs, HIV, and the LGBTQ plus community Manifests, manifests in various ways, knowingly affecting our access to and provision of healthcare, according to which identity from the vast diversity community we are focusing on. Such as the stereotyping assumptions of increased promiscuity among kinky and poly individuals, or the assumed higher promiscuity among men have sex with men and men have sex with men and women, which includes not only gays and bias, but other polysexual sexual orientation, or including the prioritization of MSM and MSMW sexual health and evaluation opposed to the invis invisibility and erasure of sexual studies of other sexually diverse ident identities, or the assumption that women who have sex with women are not at risk of STIs, 
one of the manifestations of the high, ri high rates of perceived stigma among lesbian, bisexual, and queer women. In their case, they deal with discrimination, invisibility, and lack of adequate access to specific healthcare needs. Or the intersex related stigma that impacts sexual well being and sexual lives of intersex people. Or the assumption of asexuality as a one fit for all se sexuality that does not engage in any form of intimacy, therefore is also risk free of STIs. Or the overall discrimination that associates transgender individuals with sex work due to their already social marginalization, increasing their susceptibility to STI and HIV exposure. Maybe for inadequate attention or lack thereof, the intersection between STI stigma and gender, sex, and relationship diverse identities is well evidenced. The internalization of these negative beliefs are expressed through assumptions like the following. HIV is a gay disease. Only promiscuous people have STIs. My partner tests positive for chlamydia, so it means he's cheating with me is cheating on me with a man. Monkeypox is a gay disease. I don't need to use condoms because I am straight or I don't need to use condoms because I'm on the pill. I had sex with an escort and I'm sure I have something. I received oral sex from a gay man. I need an HIV test. I don't want people to know I am in an open relationship because they'll think I have STIs. If anybody knows I have herpes, I will die alone. Similarly to HIV, I will die alone. These are just examples I have listed. However, I'm sure you have also come across them if you haven't thought similarly at some point in your life. As a result, the structural and intersectional stigma will not only impact mental health, as it will increase vulnerability and exposure to HIV and STI. The overlapped stigma around GSRD identities and STI stigma has the power to also interfere, ne interfere negatively in the outcomes of the sexual health of those victimized by it, as demonstrated by the following framework, which shows the interconnections between different forms of stigma and engagement in care. Still, physical and mental health and the disclosure of stigmatized sexual behaviors such as kink orientations impact medical care. As an example, the socio-ecological framework of HIV stigma shows on a structural aspect that stigma impacts the availability of antiretrovirus as there will be reduced affirming policies focusing on the issue. Moving to a community levels, uh, um, moving to a community level, the social awareness and social perceptions of the infection are impacted. And on an individual level, interpersonal aspects such as the lived experience of the infection and the accumulation of all what was mentioned prior weigh in on the stigma experienced by people living with HIV. Applying this stigma to the minority stress framework, it would factor within specific stressors on an external level as a manifestation of discrimination and on an internal level as an internalization of the stigma leading to syndemic negative mental and sexual health outcomes. Even when data still shows a prevalence of STI among LGBT people, namely men have sex with men, given the fact that this population is largely more studied within the context of sexual health, the approaches have been moving away from a risk behavior and potentially stigmatizing towards the understanding of how complex and smaller are the sexual networks among queer individuals, facilitating transmission of infections through sexual contact. Yet, cis and heterosexual individuals are not far behind on incidence of STIs when compared to LGBTQ+, to LGBTQ plus people, which proves once again how universal and non-judgmental STIs are and how intersectional stigma weighs heavier upon LGBTQ plus individuals. That leads to our final considerations, which relates to how to provide support in the context of stigma. First of all, it is important to prioritize inclusive and non-judgmental language, moving away from, from risk frameworks towards ideas such as increased susceptibility and increased chance of exposure. These changes must happen socially, but also in academia when analyzing intersectional factors that impact STI and HIV outcomes. Given the multifactorial aspect of STI stigma, it is important to understand that an intersectional approach decreases chances of negative outcomes. The awareness of most recent sexual health promotion approaches, such as the combination prevention framework, 
that aims to reduce the exposure to HIV and other STIs through universal measures also plays an important role in providing knowledgeable support that accounts for all levels of STI-related stigma, um, which impacts marginalized individuals from structural to personal levels. Finally, affirmative approaches that promote advocacy and build up resilience, as well as adequate supervision are also important. In summary, the stigmatization stems from a mix between structural prejudice, poor sex education, and even poorer structural institutions that fail to provide enough policies to promote awareness about sexual and reproductive health. It is a topic that is central on the fight against HIV, for example, as the stigma is highly associated with reduced engagement in care, poor outcomes for health, and increased loss of follow-up. Fighting stigma is also a fundamental part of the UN AIDS targets for the current decade, aiming towards zero discrimination and ending HIV and concomitantly STIs as a whole once and for all. Although we are impacted in different ways by, by this stigmatization, we are all victims of a system that perpetuates the understanding that STIs are the burden carried by those of us who misbehave. This rationale, intersected by cis heteronormativity, monogamy, religious dogmas, conservative arguments, and sex shaming beliefs, leads to even higher discrimination towards the sexual well being of gender, sex, and relationship diverse individuals resulting in obvious expressions of discrimination and through limitations to accessing healthcare. I hope you have enjoyed it and thank you so much for watching.